Good evening, everybody. So my name is Michaela and I'm joining you from Advantage Learn. Okay, so this evening we are joining you to chat to you a little bit more about further study subjects and how it can help you further your career. If you're joining us as a learner who's already on our further studies program, the reason why we wanted to start doing this is to get you guys thinking about your careers and how further studies can help you, introduce you to people who have already been there, done that, and have gone through the further studies program, whether it be English or maths or science. Yeah, we just wanted to to get you connected with people who have been in your shoes. If you're joining us as someone who has never done further study subject before, but you wanted to know a bit more about how it can help you in your career, welcome. So the first chat we are going to have this evening is from Natasha. She, like I say, is joining us from Joburg and she's actually one of the educators on our Further Studies English program. So some of you, if you are already doing Further Studies English, will know her very well. And if not, she will introduce herself a little bit more. And then later on in the evening, we are going to have Rourke Lilford joining us to chat about his experience with Further Studies Maths and how it's helped him in his career and in his studies. Okay, so over to you, Natasha. I will let you do a full introduction of yourself. Thank you very much, Michaela. So my name is Natasha Ferrar and I will be talking to you guys about my journey with um, FS English or as it used to be known, AP English, and how it actually set me on my path to polymathy. So polymathy, I'll talk to you guys about that a little bit as I get started, but just to give you an idea, um, if it means that you're someone who has learned a bunch of different things. You're an expert in different areas. I think you can see on the slides, on the screen at the moment, these are just some of the titles that I can use to describe myself. And these are actually, all of these titles are things that have helped me to earn an income in some way or another. I am a pianist, I'm a philosopher, I'm a public speaker, I'm a translator, I'm a violinist, I'm a photographer, I'm a researcher, I'm an editor, I'm an educator, I'm a copywriter, I'm a manager. So I wanna show you guys how Better Studies English helped me to become all of these things and how it is inspiring me to become even more. I am an FS English alumni student myself. I matriculated in 2014. Since then, I have completed three degrees with distinction through the University of Pretoria, and I'm currently doing my PhD through the University of Stellenbosch. So during my first Further Studies English class, I walked into the classroom, um, very excited that I would be allowed to study literature, um, talk about poetry, and I walked into the room and I saw this quotation on the board. If I have seen further than other men, it is because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And this is a quotation by Isaac Newton. And I remember sitting down, finding a place in the classroom and thinking, why on earth is there a quotation by a physicist on the board? Um, they're sure, like it's an inspirational quote, but couldn't we have found someone like, you know, Shakespeare or um, one of the other famous authors, one of their quotations to put on the board? Surely they also said inspiring things. And as the lecture started, and my further studies English teacher, who's actually online with us tonight as well, Mrs. Favorite, started talking, I realized why she had made the decision to do this. Isaac Newton was not just a physicist. Isaac Newton was also a philosopher. He was someone who read the works of Aristotle of Descartes. He wrote about them extensively. He was a mathematician. We know that math and physics are linked, but still they're completely different subjects once you get to the expert level of it. He was a physicist, as we all know from Newton's laws and all of those things. He was also an alchemist, which I don't think is a very normal thing that people do these days, but it's still something interesting. He was a theologian, someone who thought and wrote deeply about God, about religion, about man's relationship with God. And then he was a professor at university too, which sometimes can be, I feel, a completely separate thing. So our teacher had written this quotation by Isaac Newton on the board to show us that number one, you have always something to learn from the people around you. And number two, you can contain multitudes in Walt Whitman's words. You should never try and kind of limit yourself to one box. And that was definitely not what we were going to do in the further studies English classroom. We would not just study Shakespeare. We would not just study films. We would not just study poetry. We would study the various genres of the um, English literature or the English literary canon. And we would also 
study the words of politicians, the words of philosophers, the ways that science interacts with literature. Nothing was off topic or out of bounds in that further studies English classroom. And that is what has inspired me to become the person I am today. I used to be a very uncertain, unsure matriculant student because as I think a lot of you can relate, maybe you can raise your hand if you can relate to this, university applications always come too soon in the year. <laughs> Eureka's like immediately, she can relate to that, she knows what that feels like. For me, when university applications students open or um, applications open for the season, I sat in front of my computer thinking, what on earth am I supposed to apply for? I didn't know which university to apply for because I didn't know what department I wanted to be in, what faculty I wanted to apply for, what degree I wanted to apply for. I was the top student in my school, so I could have gone in any direction I wanted to go in, but I did not know which one. Everybody asked me this question, what do you want to be? And it terrified me. It terrified me to think that I had to limit my options and confine myself to being one thing. I had to make a decision about what I wanted to do with the rest of my life and I had to make it as a very scared 16 year old. And it took me a long time to realize that it wasn't about what I wanted to be. It wasn't about choosing one path and having to stay on that path. I needed to change the way that I asked questions about my future and I hope that when you walk away from this webinar, you are changing the way that you are asking questions about the future, or if you are a parent, that you are asking or you're changing the way that you are asking the questions about your child's future. Instead of asking, what do you want to be? We need to ask, what do you want to do? Because there are very different answers to these questions. When you phrase a question about the future as, what do you want to do? You start focusing on the difference that you want to make in the world. You start focusing on the problems that you want to solve in the world. You become an active citizen in that way. Once you can answer those questions, you're able to think about which tools or which skills you need to make those changes and solve those problems. And the lovely thing about this question is, it doesn't just apply to the university degree that you choose. It can apply if you start working directly after matric. It can apply once you're finished with your undergraduate degree and you want to decide are you going to do a postgrad degree or whether you're going to go into industry, whether you're going to start your own business. This question is a question that serves you for the rest of your life. Now, Further Studies English actually adds a number of tools to that toolbox. Whatever you decide to do with your life, whatever you decide to, whatever problems you decide to solve with your life. According to one professor, I've put his name up there if you guys want to jot that down and go find what he has um, written, Angus Fletcher. Um, he's a guy who actually holds degrees in neuroscience, so he completed a degree in neuroscience and he completed a degree in literature. And he has written extensively on how literature is simply a technology just like any other. So Professor Angus Fletcher, he said that literature is just a technology. When you are studying further studies English, you are actually learning about a technology and how humans have used this technology for years and years and years. As humans, we have narrative brains. We use stories almost every area of our life. We use stories when we introduce ourselves to people. I had to quickly tell you a story about myself. Michaela had to tell a story about herself when she introduced herself. We use stories when we present business ideas. We use stories when we teach people about new things. We use stories when we want to tell our boss why we did a certain thing. We tell stories when we are in job interviews. Stories permeate every single aspect of our existence. So when you learn how they work, how we put things together, you are able to capitalize on that and use it to its full potential. However, literature on its own is not enough. Just like technology on its own is not enough, as Steve Jobs, um, the I mean, brain behind Apple, has said as well. It is actually necessary these days to become a polymath, someone who is an expert in multiple areas, someone who is continuously learning in various disciplines. When you become a polymath, it prepares you for a changing future. Because you are not just committing to one path, you're constantly opening to new opportunities, you're constantly opening to see the links between things, you are ready to adapt as you need to adapt in our changing world. 
We know that some of these jobs that exist today, like influencers, for example, or people who are professional gamers, these things did not exist when our parents went to university. The world of work has changed so much, post-COVID even as well. The way that work is working now versus five years ago, you cannot compare it. Becoming a polymath actually makes you ready for that change in future of work. Polymathy also encourages innovation. When you are an expert in multiple areas, when you are an expert in how to think, when you are an expert in analysis, an expert in seeing the links between different things as further studies English teaches you to do, you are way more likely to become innovative, um, create revolutionary products, come up with revolutionary ideas, create amazing research. And this is something that various studies have actually shown, not just in people who are currently polymaths and currently creating innovative ideas, but if you also if you look at the kind of history of people who have gotten us to where we are today, like Isaac Newton. And finally, polymathy actually differentiates you from your peers as well. We know that this is something that Advantage Learn um, has as one of their core missions with their Further Studies students, whether that's Further Studies English, Further Studies Maths, is ensuring that when you are applying to university, when you are applying for jobs, you are differentiated from the other people who are applying for those same things. Why? Thousands of people are completing engineering degrees every year. If someone's looking at engineering degrees or engineering applicants, what makes them choose you if you have something that nobody else has? That is what makes you stand out. Unfortunately, being the best in the actual professional world doesn't always make you the best candidate. Being the best academically is not enough in this world. Number one, because it doesn't actually show that you are a varied and diverse candidate. And number two, because within a few years, somebody else will be the best and someone else will have overtaken you. Being the best is not about specializing these days anymore. Being the best is about becoming a generalist. And that is what FS English actually allows you to do. From my FS English class, when I matriculated in 2014, these are some of the directions that my peers had gone into. The people I sat in the Further Studies English class with every Friday afternoon. I'm completing a PhD in ancient Greek. One of my friends is doing a PhD in political science. We've got someone else doing a PhD in philosophy. One of our friends became a doctor. He's currently working in KZN's hospitals. Um, he completed his Bachelor of Surgery and Medicine. We have someone who became an occupational therapist, and we did actually have someone who became a writer and content editor. We know we do need those two. But as you can see, Further Studies English doesn't prime you just to become an English literature specialist or just to become an English teacher. That is not what this subject is about. It actually is that foundation that allows you to think bigger about your life and allow you to stand out in whatever area you choose to specialize in. So what my colleagues and I have done is we have, as the poem by Robert Frost said, we stood in a wood, we saw these two roads which diverge in a wood. Um, and perhaps instead of saying I, I should say we took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. I'm going to turn to the chat now to see some of those questions that came in. Oh, sorry, Kendra, I see you saying that was just a mistake, so all was good. But if any of the rest of you have any questions about my journey, about Further Studies English, about how I got to where I am, um, I'd love to chat to you about it right now. We have some few minutes um, scheduled to talk about that before we head over to Rourke for his talk. Please do ask questions, Natasha. That was so interesting and I found it quite enlightening, actually. It was, it was brilliant. I think we've all experienced in our past, for those of us who are out of school, what it feels like to get to grade 10, 11, 12 and always be asked what you want to do and feeling like you really don't know what you want to do. And yeah, it's funny how everyone seems to feel like we need to be put in a box, like we've only got one choice. I see a question about whether you can start FS English in grade 12. That depends on whether you are in grade 12 now. So if it's in the middle of your grade 12 year, unfortunately, if you're in the middle of grade 12, there's just not enough time to get to the rest of the syllabus that currently remains. But if you're coming in at the beginning of grade 12, we can still help you be ready for the time that you write your exams. Technically, this is a program that you should be doing over at least two years. So you should at least start in grade 11 or grade 12. But the amazing way that it Advantage Learn works is that we have this great website 
where you are able to actually access lectures and notes from previous lectures. So if you're joining slightly late, only at the beginning of grade 12, we actually help you to get access to some of those previous lectures so you can use um, the January holidays or um, the school holidays to catch up with everything you need to know by the time you write your prelim exam. So I hope that has answered your question, Triad. I mean, no yes or no, or if I need to add something there. I think it would be awesome if Chanel, if you could come on and maybe chat a little bit about that as well. Absolutely. What I wanted to share, I saw no one was sharing anything in the chat. And so I thought I'd just create some conversation. But for the students out there, you know, Natasha was was one of my alumni students now. And she was as my student in uh, for grade 11 and 12 for, for further studies English back in the day when we still called it AP English, Advanced Program English. And a memory that I have of her, and uh, she's probably going to be cringing now when I share this or giggling quietly to herself. But in when she was in her grade 12 year, she decided, now who decides to do this in their grade 12 year? She decided that she was going to read a hundred books. She set herself the challenge to read in her grade 12 year of all years and was still the top student in grade 12, that she was going to read a hundred books. Okay. She then excelled and, and herself and went way past that and surprised herself and actually got to 112 books and so we now have this book, list of books Natasha we often uh, send it to our students if they're not sure what they should be reading or want some recommendations of what to read so I thought I would just share that little tidbit about Natasha and also just share that even though Natasha was my student at one stage I now regard her as a colleague and I often refer to her as my esteemed colleague because she has way surpassed her teacher now. She's doing a PhD in ancient Greek. She is so multi-talented and anyone who's able to be taught by her or be in her presence really is in the presence of a genius. Um, that's how I regard her and, and, and she's worked exceptionally hard. It's not just inborn talent. She's an exceptionally hard worker. So I think that is also something that one needs to keep in mind when you are taking a further studies subject, whether it's maths, physics or English, you need to put in the hours. You need to be prepared to put in the hours. So I think that is something vital. Uh, if you are currently in grade 11, and you'd like to join Further Studies English, you can join, you can still join now. Okay, you can join now from the stage because you will have enough texts um, on which to write the exam at the end of grade 12. Right, that's much it, but thank you, Michaela. Lovely, no, that's great. What helped you decide on what you wanted to go study? Okay, so I'm going to be completely honest here. By the time I had to apply, I still didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Eureka, I was in this um, position where I was a year younger than all the rest of my peers, as I had skipped a grade earlier in my life. So my parents told me, don't take a gap year, but go to university as a gap year. They say, choose something that you're just interested in for now. Don't stress about the future yet. Go and talk to people from different areas, different degrees, different faculties, see what they study, see what they're doing with their lives. So I decided to do a BA language degree because I had always loved French. I'd always loved literature. I wanted to try philosophy. At that point in time, I did not see it as a career move at all. To me, that was just going to be my gap year. And then I got to university, started classes, and I fell completely in love with ancient Greek, which I had never imagined as part of my career, part of my future. So that was a moment of serendipity, um, if you can say it like that, or maybe it was just fate or um, God's plan for me, however you want to see it as. So I decided to complete my BA language degree. But as I also started then thinking about, okay, I've got this degree now that I enjoyed, but what do I do for work? That was when I realized that something that I love doing and something that I want to continue doing is sharing knowledge with people, whatever form that is. That can be in a form of teaching, it can be in a form of writing, in creating products that can teach other people. I just got to the point where I said, whatever I do, I want to be involved in creating and sharing knowledge. And from there, I then developed the further toolkits that I needed um, to be able to do them in various ways. So unfortunately, I don't have the best advice for you in terms of that. I see uh, Mankova has also asked there, would I recommend taking a gap year? Mankova, that really just depends on so many factors. You need to think about why you're taking that gap year, what you're doing in that gap year to ensure that you're being active, that you're doing something that's challenging you, that you're learning from, that you're growing from. You also need to ask questions about finances. So can you afford to take a gap year? So will fund you. It's really, unfortunately, I'm uncle, but I also can't answer that in the moment immediately. I think maybe you can also talk to some other career specialists. Um, it's 
always a great idea to do career guidance and career testing if you're not sure, because that can also help you decide if you do want to take a gap year before you start studying. That maybe during that gap year, you can do some intern work in different places to see how that career works and if that um, what you're tested towards or what they say you have an affinity for can help you get to. Um, yeah, like Mrs. Perfect says that if you're considering taking a gap, you're making an investigative one. So I don't take a gap year just to like, I, would, I wouldn't suggest taking a gap year just to like all prepare or just to sit at home and wait for an answer to come to you about your future. You definitely need to do something where you're learning, where you're being challenged in whatever form or fashion that is. I think the main important thing, whatever you do, whether that's gap year, whether that's starting a business, whether it's going into industry, whether that's going into a degree, make sure you are learning something. So I think that that's brilliant. Completely agree that if you're going to take a gap year, you really want to make it a constructive gap year. And there's a lot to consider in that. I think one thing, Natasha, um, I know you you maybe didn't feel like you could mention, but I'd, I'd like to mention it, that Learn to Link, who Natasha is partnering with us from, offer career guidance. So if you are wondering what you must do once you finish school and you really would like some advice please feel free to reach out to learn to link about career guidance okay and then we are going to have rock come and chat to you guys now he is an alumni ap maths student and um, he's gone and done some incredible things since completing ap maths or further studies maths one thing i forgot to mention in the intro is that this is the first year that the ieb has changed the name from advanced programs to further studies they are the exact same thing so if you hear ap maths or further studies maths or advanced programs maths they all mean the same things and we tend to use them interchangeably as we as we learn to switch our brains over to the new naming but the program is still relatively the same and so we are definitely going to get some great value from you rock so feel free to hop on now and introduce yourself thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak my name is rock I matriculated high school in 2017 and I graduated from Stellenbosch University last year with a degree in chemical engineering. And I'm now working up in Joburg for a company called TechX and my official title is a digital transformation analyst. If you have any questions what that means, you can um, ask after I finish speaking or drop something in the chat. But yeah, I think I'll just jump straight into it. So the title of my presentation this evening is FS Maths and your ticket to rocket science. Now, um, I'm sure many of you have heard this term, you're that person's a rocket scientist, and it's often sort of meant to describe someone who's somewhat intelligent. And while I wouldn't describe myself as intelligent, and I'm certainly no rocket scientist, I did graduate with, uh, with a degree in chemical engineering. And for those who don't know the industry too well, chemical engineers work a lot in the sort of petrochemical space. So it's not too much of a leap to imagine that as a chemical engineer, you could design or be part of a team building a fuel that would land up in some rocket. So, but why am I telling you all of this? So on the left, where the blue arrow is pointing, you can see a thesis from a final year chemical engineering student, which is about 60 pages and it's done over the course of a year, quite a challenging task. But the pages that you see on the right that the red arrow is pointing to, that is the final year chemical engineering design project. Now that's done over the course of just one semester. And in my mind, it is the cumulative effort of your four years of doing engineering. And it ultimately demonstrates that you have the ability to be a chemical engineer. Now, as you can see the size difference, the design project's about 250 pages. And on the next slide, you can sort of see some of the diagrams of what is involved in this uh, design project. Now, what's fascinating about this design project is that all the maths that was involved, the, the culmination of your four years of engineering, all the maths involved in this project, I had already learned by the end of matric further studies or AP maths. So if you are a part of the program, you, I would say more than halfway there to being a rocket scientist to take that as you would. So just a brief overview of what I'll be sharing with you. Firstly, when will I use this? Secondly, some of the opportunities um, FS and Maths can provide you. Uh, the goals and approach that I would maybe suggest you take if you are considering or part of the program already. And just lastly, finishing off with some notes about the teaching staff. So I'm sure you might be the student, I know I certainly was, when you leave a class and you say to yourself, oh my word, that was so silly, when am I ever going to use this? The relevance is completely lost on you. 
And this might be true for a lot of your subjects during high school, but I can say with 100% certainty that it is not the case at all with AP or Further Studies Maths. So I think I'll just run through quickly sort of my experience of FS Maths and how it's helped me and maybe just give you a little bit of an insight as to where it might help you in your future. So first off, and I guess most obvious, is the impact that AP Maths will have on your high school maths. There's a big crossover and I think that this, it, it gives you definitely an edge up in your high school maths. And I think this is particularly true in matric. And it just gives you a bit of a boost. It takes the pressure off your normal maths a little bit so you can maybe focus on some some of your other type of subjects. So just from that perspective alone, I would recommend uh, participating in the program. Secondly, when you hit university, also quite an obvious one just with the content. Now from my experiences, if you are doing a anything science related, so BSc, Physics, Chemistry, you are considering doing an engineering degree, you most certainly will engage with the mathematics that you learn in FS Maths at some point in your university career. And I will say that in my experience, when we did maths in our first year of engineering, they did the equivalent of three years work of AP Maths in one semester. So you can imagine that if you didn't do AP Maths, you're already at a massive disadvantage. So it is a huge help having done AP Maths. And maybe if you didn't understand all of it, at least you've seen it before, had some exposure. So I think that's incredibly valuable. And if you are considering doing something like a commerce degree, when I did AP Maths, our elective module that we had to take was stats. And stats was one of those big subjects in first year for many commerce degree takers that tripped them up. And all the people that did AP Maths that I know at least said that AP Maths but it gave them a, a, a major step ahead of everyone else um, and was possibly the contributing factor for them passing that first year step. And then secondly, related to university, would be the teaching methods. I think that the jump from school to university in terms of how you are taught is a massive difference. University is obviously a much larger class and there's not so much individual attention, there's a lot less spoon feeding. And I think that AP Maths is the first introduction to the style of teaching, up, like a bit of a slightly larger class, difficult content that's gone through very quickly. So just to have some exposure to that and, you know, get a little bit of a, a, a lesson in how you should ap apply yourself in, in a classroom setting like that is a great help. Then I would say that, you know, if, if you were to say to me now, you know, Rourke, this is great. I, I don't really want to do a commerce degree and, you know, engineering and maths is like the far, furthest thing away from my interest in terms of a career choice, you know, my passion lies with history or, you know, ancient Greek or something like that. I would say that the AP Maths course still adds incredible relevance to your life because it teaches you how to approach solving a problem in a way that I don't think there's any other subject that at least I've done prepares you to do. So take it for that, for that reason alone. And then my last point on when you use this is in a workplace application. I can only really speak to my experience, but when I entered into my place of employment this year, the first thing they said to us was, guys, we haven't hired you to tell you what to do. We've hired you for you to tell us what to do. And I think that AP Maths gives you this problem solving ability, and that's very applicable in the workplace with, with, with whatever you do. I mean, I'm, I'm currently working for a company that does customs compliance, and I study engineering. I mean, the, the relevance is, is not there at all. And yet I think the, the application of, of problem solving is what employees are looking for and will most certainly help you in your future career. So some of the opportunities that AP Maths can provide you going forward into your future. So the first one I'd, I'd like to mention is the NBT. For those of you that don't know, it stands for the National Benchmarking Test. And it's a sort of standardized test that South African universities use to sort of judge your academic competence. Um, and in, in many cases, it can be the deciding factor on whether or not you get into the university and course of your choice. So doing well in those NBTs is, is very important. And I'll just speak a little bit to the maths portion of that NBT. AP maths prepares you not in, in, in a way that high school maths, normal um, the maths, can't prepare you for, sorry, I see there's a, a question. Anyway, it, it prepares you for that NBT like no other. It really does give you a leg up. And I think that the history of AP Maths students would show the improvement on those NBT marks compared to other students. And just on that note, I know Advantage Learn offer some NBT courses as well, which are amazing. I did them and they really, really helped my NBT prep. So if you are in matric about to do the NBT, really consider 
taking those courses. As a bit of an aside, I was actually chatting to a colleague today and he stumbled across the Advantage Learn NVT course and he said it was a massive help on him and him doing well. So don't only take it from me. Secondly, and another form of a standardized test is the SAT, which stands for the Scholastic Aptitude Test. And that is the American University equivalent of the NBT, which you have to do if you are looking to study overseas in America. So if that's something you're considering, I would say that it is almost impossible to get a good mark on the SAT if you haven't done AP Maths. Uh, there's content that is tested in the SAT that is not covered in normal high school maths and that is definitely covered in AP Maths. I did the SAT test and I, you know, I'm a true testament to the fact that the AP Maths course helped me massively in that I honestly don't know how I would have done it without AP Maths. So if you are considering studying overseas, stick with the AP Math program or if, that, if you aren't in the program yet uh, and that is something you'd like to consider in your future, definitely consider um, getting involved with the program. And then lastly would just be your CV. I think AP Maths looks great on a CV, firstly because of the problem solving application it has, as I've already mentioned. And secondly, I also think it demonstrates a bit of time management and discipline. The AP Maths course is very difficult and it requires, as has already been mentioned, some hours outside of work and it's managing extracurriculars. And it's by no means easy. So having done that, I think represents a, a sense of your character and, and it can't be a negative thing to have on your CV. So Following on from that, maybe these are just some of the goals and approaches that I would suggest for people in the program or thinking of taking the program. So I'll start with the goals. So the first goal I think you should look to achieve when completing the AP Maths program is to learn for understanding. Like in some high school subjects, you can get away with sort of learning the patterns and you can still do well enough just by sort of, you know, parrot learning. Uh, the patterns and copying that across and AP Maths, uh, unlike those subjects, will find you out if you really don't have an un internalized and understand the work deeply. So if you are in the program, considering you're in the program, really aim to learn for understanding and this applies most definitely to university. And if you can take this approach with your learning throughout your life, I think it would stay in very good stead. Secondly, it's practice for life after school. As I've already mentioned, sort of in terms of the university content and how uh, lectures are conducted in university, it's a great practice for that. So even if you feel like you're really struggling with the work and you may be not passing, it, it has applications in, in other areas. And even if you are not considering doing any sort of form of further education or tertiary education, I still think the discipline that it teaches you is valuable and something you can take on after school. So those are sort of the goals that I would recommend. And then the approach that I think you should take with AP Maths. Uh, the first and most important in my mind is to have a sense of grit and determination. As I've already mentioned, it's not easy. And at times you will definitely feel despondent, like, geez, I don't get this. I'm going nowhere. My advice and recommendation is just to stick with it. You will definitely reap the benefits in one way or another. If I look to my own life, I don't think I've passed the test from grade 10 to 12 right up until the last grade 12 final exam and I was able to manage, I managed to pass that. So don't think it's the end of the world if you fail the test, um, it is almost bound to happen. And the last sort of approach that I think you should take is maximum effort, give it a full crack and, and I think you might surprise yourself with how well you do and it won't be a bad thing getting a good mark. So see how well you can do and really push yourself and I think you might find the process even a little bit of fun. And then this just brings me on to my last point, the teaching staff. They have um, an extraordinary wealth of knowledge. I mean, Natasha and Chanel have already uh, demonstrated that more than I could say. I, I mean, I, when I was there, Trish Park was my teacher and I believe she's still teaching. She'd been doing that for years and years and years. And Chris, he's a qualified chemical engineer. So I'm not sure, really sure if I'm allowed to say uh, he's clever, but he, uh, he, uh, I, I'd like to think he's very clever. And yeah, they've been doing it for loads of years, a wealth of experience and so forth. The parents that are maybe listening, your children are in great hands. And for the students, know that you probably couldn't find better teachers in any other program. And I guess this maybe leads me nicely on to, you know, the sort of backstory and how AP Maths and the teachers specifically influenced my life. When I was in matric, Trish Park, after one of our classes, asked me what I was going to study in the year after. And I told her medicine because that was sort of what I was thinking at the time. And she really actually in, in front of like a bunch of other people started shouting at me saying like, no, you're making a massive mistake. You've got to do something with maths. Your options are either engineering or 
bacterial science and I was quite taken aback and I almost went home and I thought to myself, geez, who, who is this lady? Like she's shouting at me, my barely knows me and is like encouraging me to change like arguably the biggest decision of my life. And thankfully for me, I listened to her and it completely changed the trajectory of my life and, and looking back, I would change absolutely nothing. So I'd also like to just take this opportunity to say a massive thank you to Trish. They're instrumental in, in the course of my life and my career now. And that's sort of why I've included the, the picture on the left that some of our friends in our graduating class, I, you know, I've made some of my best friends that I consider friends for life at university doing the course that I did. So they can have a real massive impact in your life. And I think this r really demonstrates the difference between teachers and educators. And in my mind, at least, a, a, a teacher is someone who, who teaches because it's their occupation I and mean, it's what they pay to do. And an educator is someone who teaches because it's their passion. And every person that I've come in, into contact with at Advantage Learn, they are they epitomize an educator for me. And, I, and I'm not getting paid to say this, I'm not being compensated. So it really just is my personal experience of the staff and the teachers. And you honestly cannot find anyone better anywhere. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. I'd like to just finish off by saying, Sometimes it might feel like the rocket is crashing a little bit, but don't be disheartened, uh, stick with it and you will reap the reward. So thanks very much. If you've got any questions, you can raise your hand or, or drop it in the chat. I see this one already saying, what do you do on a typical day at your job? My title, Digital Transformation Analyst, we sort of optimize our business processes and are more involved in, in the finance sphere of our business. So a typical day would be request from the finance team for a certain process that they would like optimize and we sort of scope out the solution to that and and possibly build it as well i, I think that's probably about as good an answer as i can get if you've got a bit more of a specific question more than happy to answer that or if you feel like i didn't answer your question at all let me know and i'll, I'll try better <laughs> no problem i think that was a great answer rock um we do have another question is it true that universities only check your top 10 subjects so if I do badly in Afrikaans, but I do really well in further studies maths, can I sub in the further studies subject in place of Afrikaans? I think the, the best way to answer this is to say that every university is different. So their requirements are different. So I think, I don't think any of us here, even if, if Rourke maybe experienced that his university only checked his top ten, uh, seven subjects, for example, that's not necessarily the case for every university. If you do have a specific question for a university like that, and you know which university you're applying for, it's a great idea to reach out to them and ask them what they look at. There's no guarantee that they will tell you that because they do like to keep that up their sleeve a little bit. But I do think that it's a fair um, assumption to make that if you have further studies, a further study subject and you have done incredibly well in that subject, but perhaps a language subject like Afrikaans is not that great and you're applying for a really technical degree program, then I certainly would imagine that they would take your further studies maths as a positive sign that you will do well in that program. And certainly if they're looking at two learners with similar Afrikaans results, as you described in your example, and one has taken further studies maths and the other has not, they will definitely be looking more at the person who has done the extra thing and has, has gone the extra mile. Yeah, I'd just like to add in something uh, small there. The universities who do allow that, you're not allowed to replace any of the further studies subjects for English, Afrikaans or maths or whatever your second language is. But you can, for, for the universities that allow it, you can substitute them for other subjects, but not for those three. So not for English, Afrikaans or whatever the other second language is and maths. Okay. Would you be interested in studying another course? Very funny you mentioned that I actually am doing another course at the moment. Um, I'm studying towards my CFA level one, which is Chartered Financial Analyst. So sort of to do with um, uh, investments. And I guess that's also a, a great follow on to what I consider going into chemical engineering for a career. I don't necessarily think that that's exactly where my passions lie. I think it's more in a financial realm. That's why I'm sort of going the CFA route. It's, it's definitely not a bad career at all, though. Got nothing against it. Yeah, I think it just sort of in my engineering class, at least I, I saw people that were engineers, engineers, and that was, you know, their passion and they were great at it. And I don't think I was really ever that student. And where I am now, they employ lots of engineers who sort of feel the same. So 
hope that's answered the question. And I'll just hop on to the next one quickly while I'm at it. How would you go about taking the SAT? So there's a site called College Board. I think that's correct. Just go have a look in there and it's, it's pretty self-explanatory in terms of the steps you'd need to uh, like take to sign up and study for the SAT. And does doing well on it necessarily mean you can go and study overseas? Uh, it doesn't guarantee it in any sense. It certainly helps. And especially as an international student, it's a, it's a very likely chance that you can't afford the fees to go and study overseas. They're a lot more expensive than South African universities, for example. So in many cases, that means the university providing some sort of financial aid for you. So they would be putting in a little bit extra into your education, for example. And I did the SAT, I did relatively well in it, and I applied overseas and I got rejected. So that just goes to show that doing well is not necessarily you know, your, your ticket over there. I would say if you are looking to go overseas, that having a, Natasha mentioned, you know, a, a, broad, a broad range of interests and achievements, uh, on top of a good score for your SAT, um, you've got a very good chance. So, yeah, hope that answers the question. Are there a lot of job opportunities in engineering? I, I think I'm a bit biased in this regard, but I'd say definitely yes. And I think more and more as like time goes along that the role of the engineering society has changed a little bit and I think maybe I'd be a good example of that. You know, I studied ChemEng and you know, my job's got absolutely nothing to do with that. So if you are passionate about the engineering, you know, there's there's lots of realms you can go. You can sort of go more the more manufacturing route or consulting. So there's different options there. And then there's lots of different options outside of that. On my job, I was flexible. Yes and no. We recently come back to the office full time. So uh, the sort of working arrangement in, in our office is However you get your, so your, your eight to five is, I guess, your standard working hours. If you want to get in at seven and leave at four, get in at nine and leave at six or 10 and seven, that's pretty much up to you. But there's sort of, I guess, a requirement that you do fill those hours. But again, it's, it is, um, I mean, everyone in the office I work at is very nice and no one's like sitting there watching your clock. So in, in that sense, it is, it is flexible. What elective did you take for further studies, maths, and why? I took stats, not because I had a choice, just because that was what we were assigned when, when I did AP Maths. If I could go back and have the choice, I would choose stats. I think I had to do a stats module in my engineering course. AP Maths stats helped me massively in that. I think, especially if you're considering a commerce degree, stats should really be on your horizon as the one to take. I think it's a massive help in your first year. And even now um, in my sort of CFA studying, I'm seeing a, lo a lot of like recurring themes from AP Maths and I've been out of school for five years. So the impact is never ending. And I do have an observation on one of the questions that was posed uh, for yeah. overseas universities and studying overseas. Um, recently, I've been listening to a lot of international webinars of universities in Canada, in the States and uh, in, in uh, the UK as well. And the requirements are really, really tough. Okay, they're looking at from, from a Cambridge perspective, they're looking at three three A stars and an A star is like an A plus 90s. They want, you know, three A levels, but at 90s. And that's only when they consider you. But what they're saying is the differentiating factor is something called a personal statement. So I thought I'd just make the students aware of that. If you want to study abroad, most of these Ivy League universities or even just you know in international universities, the personal statement that you write is very, very important. And that is often the deciding factor. And the reason I'm mentioning it is that every single presenter mentioned that and mentioned how important it is and so you can actually go onto the net and you there are courses that are being run now on how to write your personal statement because it's become so important to excel in that area too when you're applying so just be aware of the fact that it's not only your marks and and what you you know where that's concerned you do need to show who you are and why you're wanting to study and and follow that particular course and and why you're passionate about it and they look at your life experience so they're looking at your life experience and everything else you've been exposed to extracurricularly and an extracurricular environment as well so just keep that in mind too okay it's not just the academics that count I've heard that getting a job can be a bit hard. What can one do to be able to secure some sort of stable financial income in the career field that they're interested in? That's an interesting question. I don't know if I can, I can give you a definitive answer. I could say that 
I guess my, my experience has been that if you are interested in a field, I still think, and I guess this is just my personal opinion, that the most secure way of getting into that field is still by going to university and doing a degree in, in what you're interested in, getting a job aligned to, you know, I guess your passion and, and that and that degree. I, I guess sort of that, that would really be the only sort of advice I could offer you. Michaela, I don't know if you've got any yeah. other suggestions there. Um, well, I think it really is a tough question. And, and sometimes it is difficult because you are interested in something and you know that it's not necessarily going to be the most financially viable option for you. But I do think that for most of us, we have a couple of choices and thoughts in our head of what we are interested in in terms of a career or what we're interested in as a hobby and a lot of those things can generate income i think i would love for natasha i, I see you've popped some some thoughts in the chat there so i'd love for you to come on but i also just want to mention something else career guidance from someone can also be extremely helpful so as i mentioned learn to link do offer career guidance and it's an incredible thing to be able to sit down with someone who's who understands psychometric testing and can work through it with you and can can help you to figure out various career opportunities for you and then from there you can explore your options and decide what the most financially viable option is for you I also think that you can look at certain industries in some industries there's a lot more competition around than others and so it can make it a little bit easier to get into an industry if there's a bit less competition but yeah Natasha please feel free to hop on and add your thoughts. The main one that I can just add guys and this is speaking from my own personal experience and from my friends who are also now we're all in our mid late 20s <laughs> so we're also all still trying to figure out how do you get that stable income um, to ensure that you can pay your rent that you can pay your medical aid that you can pay to go out and have some takeaway every now and again and what we have found is that you need multiple streams of income it's not enough just to depend on one job use the internet there are so many ways that you can set up the internet to help you to have passive income don't just think that the only place to get money is by doing a nine-to-five job that's not true so i think go and search about that um, see what you can find on the net there are so many amazing resources for that and that can also help you to imagine a different path great thoughts how many hours a week, Rock, did you spend studying for the studies maths? What a, what, a, what a great question. I'll be completely honest that for the most part from grade, you know, 10 through to 12, the studying was the hour, hour and a half class once a week. And I think that was my downfall, a bit too like, you know, when I wasn't passing. And a lot of the other students is that we just didn't put in like any sort of time after FS maths. And I think even if it's an hour a week, it's incredibly beneficial. And for my final exam at the end of matric, I put in a lot of time. Oh, I mean, they would definitely be on like the scale of like up, like, you know, 15 sort of hours for the, you know, final exam at the very minimum and it reaped massive rewards. So maybe a better question, because I clearly didn't work hard enough, is how many hours a week you should be putting in. And I would say any time above your scheduled lesson is great. I would say aim for an hour, and if an hour is all you reach, great. Um, if you can do two or three, even better. Although that being said, you know, it, it, AP Maths is, is a bit of a juggling match with, you know, your normal school subjects and all your extracurriculars. So try and keep that in mind. Aim for an hour. I think that's sort of low hanging fruit that you can realistically achieve. What jobs have the most flexible hours while still paying a comfortable salary? I think that's going to be quite a difficult one to answer. So I feel like there are probably a, a wide array of jobs that we could we could mention, and I think it also does depend on on your workplace. So a lot of these things depends on where you end up working, because you might end up in a very strict corporate environment if you're going into into the corporate world, and then your your job is going to be very much set work hours and that sort of thing but if you're stepping into an organization that's a lot more flexible it's not necessarily about your career but it's also about your workplace and if your workplace is a lot more flexible then like rock mentioned earlier he's his workplace is not very particularly stressed about whether he starts working at 7 a.m or starts working at 10 a.m as long as the work gets done and and you're you're putting in a reasonable amount of hours and getting your job done and so i feel like the the best way to look at it would be to to just 
consider whether your career would enable you to have the option to work for an organization or a company that will allow you to be flexible because something like working in a hospital is is not exactly going to give you flexible work hours there are very obvious jobs that have set times and then there are others that have more general times what careers can you go into if you study maths further in university rock i'm not sure if you have a good take on that nothing too specific however i would say that i wouldn't i wouldn't be too stressed that you you won't find a job you know I, i'm sure my company for example would definitely hire someone that you know did maths as a as a subject i mean as a career choice i mean as a field of study at university by itself so i i would say more if you if you worried about that and, and going into university you rather ask yourself the question is this what i'm passionate about is this what i can see myself love studying and if that's the answer then i wouldn't really think too much further than that i think the job sort of comes after the fact and it's while it's, it's still something you should consider you are going to be studying that thing for at the very minimum three years so at least or at least try and enjoy it would be the advice i would offer yeah definitely i think i think a mi mistake that a lot of us make is thinking that what we study is what we're going to end up doing after after we study and so that's a really good point that rock makes that if you do study maths and i'm forgetting the exact terminology for the for the maths degree program but if you do study that degree program then you're definitely not going to be boxed into a very specific career type and they it will open up a lot of doors for you yeah i think that this has been a brilliant session if anyone else does have questions please continue to pop them in the chat we are very open to answering your questions there have been a lot of questions around careers and that sort of thing so i think that's definitely on a lot of your minds i would highly encourage you to to go online and just see what resources are out there there are incredible resources to help guide your decision in terms of um, which career you should step into where would you suggest we go for studying engineering i don't think there is a one best place or a couple best places i think you've got to look at your personal situation where you live, do you want to study away from home? I, like, it's, it's not just a, a simple question. And I would say that most of the universities in South Africa are great options for studying engineering. If you are, if you're wanting to do a very simple check, go have a look if that university is registered, uh, registered with EXA, which is the Engineering Council of South Africa. And for the most part, I, I think pretty much every single one is. So as long as they meet those standards and they're keeping up with their exit points, you're getting basically the same standard of education. So then look more to, is this the place I want to live in? Does the culture sort of fit my personality? More questions along those lines. Yeah, guys, I do want to encourage you, if anyone does have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. I think for anyone hanging on and waiting for us to end, I think this is pretty much rounded out the evening. I've just checked the time. I see that we're two minutes over. So if anyone needs to hop off, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Natasha and Rourke, for your time and your expertise and your knowledge in your various fields. We appreciate you guys. Thank you. Did any of you study with a financial aid, such as a scholarship? If so, how did you attain it? So the answer is yes. I was part of the Alan Gray August Foundation as a candidate fellow, uh, and I've just recently graduated into the into the fellowship. And they do provide financial aid for university. If you are looking to apply, just go onto the website Alan Gray August Foundation, and it's it's displayed there in a very easy to follow way and they'll guide you through the process all the way through if you're interested in something like that. Lovely, that's a great answer. Natasha, anything from your side? Did you study using any sort of scholarship or something along those lines? So for my side, um, unfortunately in the humanities faculty there aren't that many scholarships available at the moment. Unfortunately they kind of streaming it more towards STEM subjects but in postgrad usually the universities have scholarships available internally even. So if you're doing an honours or a master's or a doctorate, it's usually fully funded. My PhD is fully funded by the university at this point in time, so I'm not paying for my PhD at all. In terms of applying for financial aid, Grob was saying go to the website, definitely just Google 
scholarships in South Africa for university, you'll find so many great options. Make sure you go to the specific website of the people giving the scholarship. That's the best way to get the info. You're just hearing it from someone else. They might not give you all the info you need to have the strong application. So find the scholarships, Google them, go to the actual websites, apply for as many as you can, I think as well. And then also try and make your marks as high as possible. A lot of times the universities give you a discount if you have distinctions in the trick. And if you have an average, that is a distinction. So try your best in the trick already and that will really help you as well. Completely agree with that. For overseas studying, are there three A-levels, any three subjects, for example, maths, further studies, physics, and AP maths? Are the three A-levels, any three subjects, for example, the reason I can answer that is that my son is actually doing maths. Uh, he's opted for maths, physics and computer science at A level, and that will get you into any university. But of course, then, as I mentioned previously, the, the, the personal statement then is what you need to have to back that up. So three A levels, yes, you would be able to do it with those three. And, and depending on the course, of course, and what their, what their requirements are. But yes, three, they, they want three A levels, nothing less. If I could maybe just as well, I guess for the American side of things, just because I, I did that, it's very course dependent. Um, so for example, I was looking to study engineering. So like a prereq was you do the SAT and you have to do a math subject test and then you have to choose other physical chemistry. So it's also very course dependent. You just have to sort of, you know, find out. Sorry for the American side, I know that wasn't really related to the equation. No, that on. that is helpful. That's helpful. I'm sure that there are some learners who are interested in, in finding out more about studying in the US as well. I don't see any questions in the chat in the Q&A, so I think we can call it an evening. Thanks so much, everyone.